As always, these events are sponsored by the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee, a volunteer group made up of like-minded citizens here in the town of Woodside, wanting to provide you, our audience, with the best possible presentation, programs, experiences that we can. Now this evening, we are once again quite fortunate to have a member of the staff of FIOLE available to us. Now, almost since the beginning, and it's been almost 10 years now, since the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee was formed, we have developed a relationship with our good neighbor, Fioli, and have had them many times give wonderful presentations, talking about different aspects of this incredible treasure that's right in our backyard. And this evening, we are fortunate again to have Julie, who will be talking to us about a subject that some people might consider fragile and others might consider uh, quite durable and uh, quite long lasting. In fact, I wanted to say that ceramics is the oldest form of technology we have. After cooking meat, baking clay was the first thing that humans did to chemically alter our environment on purpose. You can't make rice without cooking in it some kind of vessel. So clay pots go hand in hand with agriculture. Our whole evolution as a people and a species is connected to it. There's only a short period of history in which people haven't been connected to pottery. And this evening, we are very fortunate that Julie is gonna be talking about the fantastic porcelain collection that can be found, observed, and enjoyed at Fioli. So without further ado, here is Julie. Thank you. Hello, I'm happy to be with your group today. First Fridays is often a chance for us to share what's happening on property just down the road at Filoli. Today we'll be discussing our ongoing spring exhibition, Bringing the Garden Indoors, Captured Blooms. And my name is Julie Blydevere, and I am the Director of Museum Collections for Filoli. I take care of not only our museum object collection, but my team also takes care of our libraries, archives, and uh, works with our educational collections as well. We follow our mission to connect our rich history with the vibrant future through beauty, nature, and shared stories. This is threaded throughout everything that we do, including the exhibition, I hope you will come and visit. It's in line with our vision when we envision a time when all people honor nature, value unique experiences, and appreciate beauty in their everyday life. Part of the way that we make our strategic plan happen and bring it to fruition is through objects, uh, interpretation, exhibits like the one that we'll be discussing today. And part of that is through engagement and education. We wanna redefine how visitors connect with history, beauty, and nature, through innovative engagement, educational and interpretive programs. And our spring exhibition is doing just that. But table settings mean something special to me. I grew up with a grandmother who had a thing for porcelain. She loved different table settings. She loved setting a beautiful table. She loved coordinating the tablescape with the food that she was serving so that you had an immersive environment. And I'm quite fortunate that here at Filoli, we have hundreds of porcelain objects and ceramic objects throughout the collection, and that we're often setting a beautiful table. Um, but the porcelain that you'll be seeing is not just on the tables and in the display cases, but also larger pieces that are spread throughout the house. The porcelain will always have a special meaning to me and a connection to my grandmother, Ruby. First, let's talk about some different types of porcelains. As I said, we have more than 300 porcelain and ceramic objects in our museum object collection directory. 
they're grouped into groups by their primary materials. So first, you'll see quite a lot of true or hard paste porcelain, and we'll get into definitions for these in a moment, but also something called soft paste porcelain, faience or majelica, which is a form of tin glazed earthenware, technically, as well as bone china, bisque, and pearlware. So let's get into a little bit of the definitions. True or hard paste porcelain is originally a Chinese invention about the seventh to eighth century. That paste mixture, that which they make the porcelain body out of, the thing that you see people use on a clay wheel or forming and with their hands, um, all of these vessels and objects are made of a mixture. And the original Chinese formula has kaolin, which is a white clay that was inherent in the area. And it also, they added in a stone called petunsi. And that has naturally a mixture of feldspar and mica and quartz in it. That is what would melt at extremely high temperatures. And that's why if you fire these objects at 2,645 degrees Fahrenheit, they actually start to fuse inside, much like a glass. All of that stone and mica and quartz and that clay mixture fuse together chemically and they change. And that results in a structure that's uh, very sharp and more like glass. So if you've ever broken a porcelain cup, you know that it has that very sharp edge. It doesn't look crumbly or coarse inside. It looks like a clean break. And this was incredibly popular. Um, some people called it white gold at the time. Only princes and nobility could afford to import it beginning in the 16th to 18th century in Europe. And it was highly desirable. But when you see these objects, they were so rare and so collectible that you wouldn't actually be using them. They were purely for decorative and collecting habits. And so that's when hard paste was introduced to Europe and immediately European markets wanted to try to jump on the craze and create their own version of it. But they didn't have a few things. First, they didn't know that they needed kaolin, that white clay. They also didn't have the petunsi mixture quite right. So in the 17th century, they start to try to attempt to make their own mixture and body. And because it was missing those things, it and they didn't fire it hot enough, they only went to about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. And unlike the 2645, which is nearly hot enough to melt iron, um, by not fully fusing and melting those components, they ended up with something that's far more closely resembles a ceramic with that crumbly chalky interior. Um, it's definitely granular. If you've ever broken a pot in your garden, you are most likely familiar with that almost uh, broken cookie look to it. And because they aren't fully fired to that full temperature, they're also more likely to crack um, and uh, break during the process. Faience and Majelica. Uh, Faience is a tin glazed earthenware. You'll see it across Europe um, and even in ancient areas. Like there's an Egyptian Faience variety as well. Um, it's a fine grade earthenware. Um, when you talk about Majelica, it's a little bit finer, coarser, not as coarse in that crumbly cookie area. Um, think about it getting a little smaller, a little more um, fused together but it's really the tin glaze that they put on the outside of it that has that bright white and then the really decorative bright colors that they put on top of it. And they also are firing this at a lower, cooler temperature, um, not realizing that if they got it hotter, they would get a truer porcelain finish. And so again, much like soft paste, they end up with that crumbly cookie kind of interior when they break. Um, and they are also more likely to crack and craze um, and have that spider web crazing across them um, and break during the cooling process. But that was a technique that the Italians had invented um, on their attempt to copy the original Chinese porcelain. 
Pearlware is sort of similar. Um, it's not fired at as high a temperature, so it still has that granular crumbly body inside if it were to break. Um, because it's so porous, you do need to fully glaze it in order to be able to use it. And the glaze actually, the frit that they make it out of um, does actually have a little bit of glass like substance in it. And so that actually does fuse and melt. And that gives you that hard sealing outer um, encasement. And that's why you get this beautiful luster to it. That's a little different than the tin glaze that we've seen prior to this. Bone China, just as you would guess, has bone ash in it. So this was an English attempt in the mid 18th century to again copy that exported Chinese porcelain that was still in high demand. And their paste um, actually included up to 50% bone ash. And so that mixed in with the clay, uh, you end up with a different color to the porcelain body. Um, they did fire it at quite a high temperature by the 18th century. They were learning that the higher temperature was important. And so you do have a similar break pattern. You get a shard instead of um, a shard. <laughs> so if it's a piece of ceramic and it breaks, you have a shard. If it's more glass-like, you have a shard. So we have quite a bit of bone china in our collection as well. Bisque, we only have a few pieces of bisque in the collection. Um, you can make bisque out of either a hard paste body or a soft paste body, um, but it is fired, but it's not glazed. And so you're left with this pure white of your paste mixture or a soft white, um, depending on the color of your clay. And you'll have that porous outer body. And part of what they think that these were originally meant to mimic is carved sugar sculptures, um, informed sugar sculptures that had been decorating tables. I think what we don't always realize is that these porcelain figures weren't always meant to be statuary. In the very beginning, they were meant to be table decorations that kind of danced across your dessert table. You would have these little scenes. And so sugar sculptures were another uh, material that these scenes were made out of early on. And we think maybe some of these early bisque sculptures in little statuettes are meant to mimic that earlier texture and look. Well, I would have loved to have been mobile like we were earlier um, during the pandemic and take you around with the tablet and be able to show you spaces like we did during the drawing room talk um, a couple of years ago now. But Wi-Fi in the house is actually a little spotty <laughs> and it's not one network. Um, and so I would be dropped as I walked from room to room and have to catch you again. So that's why we're doing this in my office and I've taken pictures and I'm going to highlight some of the pieces that I think you should take a, a look at and keep a close eye out for when you come to visit the exhibit. So when you enter through the foyer and you're gonna turn right into the ladies cloak room, you're gonna see a really wonderful, beautiful selection of French soft paste porcelain in our collection. Um, many of these were created in the early 18th century um, when Europe was just starting to really try to figure out how to make those copies. And so these soft paste porcelain pieces are, are quite rare and quite beautiful and um, just really special. And we don't have them out all the time. Um, so it's kind of neat to be able to see them. And I've taken from the collection pieces that had blooms and, and floral representation. So it's a very targeted view at our porcelain collection all throughout the house. This is one of the little special pieces that you'll see on display right now. Made in 1735, this little soft paste porcelain salt cellar um, has this beautiful cakemon decoration. It's quite small, it's only a few inches. And because you don't usually get to see the details, it's really nice to be able to blow it up this big for you actually. <laughs> And this is um, made by the St. Cloud Factor Manufactory um, in France about that time. And it's one of these early pieces. And so you can just imagine having one of those little ivory spoons um, and, or a little tiny silver spoon and be able to pull out a little salt there for your meal. There's also this wonderful little soft paste porcelain cane handle. 
made in the mid 18th century by the Chantilly factory in France. And again, it has this delicate Kegelmann decoration on the white body with red, blue, green uh, decoration, and just a really delicate, um, beautiful representation of flowers and leaves across it on all sides. This piece is one of the showstoppers, um, in my opinion. <laughs> it was made about 1750, and there is some debate. We've had a number of porcelain experts look at it. It's definitely French soft paste. Um, it's definitely from about 1750. Everybody agrees on that. But the runners up are that it could be the Vicennes, the Manessi, or the St. Cloud factory that made it. It's not marked. And as you can imagine, just looking for marks on this can be quite stressful as each of these is formed out of its own soft paste porcelain components to put all these flowers together on metal stems that then run into this beautiful vase. Um, so anytime we have to move it and do anything with it, um, everybody is very calm and collected and ready to safely find it a new home or a new display spot. Um, but it's a really special piece in the collection. As you move into the hallway, you're going to see cases, each with a selection of porcelains um, that are all capturing blooms, representation of flowers. And so I've picked out just a few that always catch my eye or have been catching visitors' eyes since the exhibit opened this winter. This little plate is a beautiful botanical representation of this poppy and um, the ciscus and canvas. It was painted by quite a well-known uh, artist. So the plate itself was made by the Albert Armored Limited Company, an English manufacturer about 1813 to 1815. It's also made out of soft paste porcelain. It has this beautiful gilded border, but then often there was painters who would come in and hand paint the plates. And sometimes those painters, um, more so even than their manufactory, are the ones that everybody watches. And William Quaker Pegg is the artist that did this wonderful representation. Um, and he is quite well known for his rare paintings of botanicals. This is an object that may not have originally caught my eye, but seems to be catching all of the eyes of our visitors because they can't figure out what it is. If you look at it, do you know what it is? You can see that it has a dip there on the one side and then it has two holes so that you could put some sort of strap or something through it, a tie of some sort. Well, this tin glazed earthenware is a barber's bowl. So you could put that bowl right up against the neck and be able to shave and not have anything come down onto the person being shaved. Um, it was made about 1720 to 1750 in the Netherlands. And it's this blue and white patterning um, and decoration that's known as Delftware. And you can see some of that crumbly texture on the breaks on this plate. You can see how it, it does really resemble um, a ceramic pot that you may have in your garden when it breaks. When that glaze breaks, it actually puts the body at risk of water intruding in because it's so porous, it could allow more water to come in, which could then allow more glaze to break off. Um, so it's, a, it's nice to be able to see into that little break right now, um, but it's also a sign that this piece has been harmed in the past. Another of our bone china plates, really so that you can see that bright lustrous white that comes from that mixture of 50% cow bone. These were made in England um, by the Nantwar Guar. I never seem to pronounce that one correctly, forgive me, <laughs> Nantwar. And uh, it's a bone china plate made about 1817 to 1819. And again, this set is all decorated with gilt trim and has these lovely hand-painted roses um, and little violets to match. This is one of our hard paste porcelain Chinese pieces. It's a 19th century piece um, made in China, and it's an excellent example of high quality exports. So there's quite a lot of Chinese export ware that is hard paste porcelain, but may have a less than um, high styled design on it. It may not be as well done um, in the 
the art artistic hand of the person doing the decoration. This one, as you can see, has this beautiful scene that wraps all the way around the vessel, as well as having a formed handle of a dragon. And his little legs and tail come down on the side there on the left, and then his spotted body comes up and over, and then he's wrapping his arms and his uh, chin up towards the spout of this pitcher. So he happens to be my favorite little dragon motif in all of our museum object collection. But it's also just a really nice example of that bright white body, thanks to Chinese kaolin, and a fine hand at decoration with that simple, only blue being used. And still you get such a vivid scene and a really high quality scene as well. In contrast, you can see the hand on this one is not quite as, as talented. It's not quite as sharp. Um, it's just not quite as well done. Um, this is a 1760 tin glazed earthenware piece. Again, you can kind of see areas where that glazing has chipped over the last few hundred years. And some of that darker body is beginning to show. It's not as pure white. This has a, that tin glaze over it that's bright white. And so that's why they're trying to because their mixture isn't as high quality and as um, white in appearance, by using the glaze, they're trying to mimic that beautiful white body that we just saw on the last picture. This is actually a flower arranging container um, made about 1760 in England in Liverpool. And it's also in this Delftware pattern of just blue on a white body. As we go into the gentlemen's lounge, if you haven't had a chance to see our gentlemen's lounge um, since the recent renovations, I hope that you'll read more about it on a blog on our website um, that you can get to at filoli.org. Um, we talk about the whole project from start to finish. But one of the things that we use during projects like this is the 1936 inventory or the 1975 auction catalogs. There's also a 1937 auction. So it can kind of tell us what objects were in there. And what we found particularly interesting for this porcelain exhibit was that there was a number of pieces of majelica in the room, as well as other porcelains and other statuary made out of other materials such as bronze. One of the majelic pieces that we have in there at the moment is an early 20th century piece, an identified maker, but definitely Italian in the Geruda style. And you can see, much like uh, we've discussed with some of these tin glazed earthenware, this is a high, finer grade body, but again, using that bright white tin glaze, which then they're able to put these bright, vivid painted colors on top and seal all of that in with a fine frit. So that you get a nice shiny surface that's vivid and colorful. But if you were to break this, it would have that coarse cookie crumbly interior. This soft paste porcelain statue is a rare piece. Um, it's because of the size and the scale. He's about a foot tall and it's Shakespeare leaning on his books and on his works there on a lovely column. And he's standing amongst a beautiful floral garden, um, which every one of these little flowers is just so exquisitely done. It was about 1759 to 1764, based on the crown mark on the bottom of this piece. It's definitely Chelsea and English, but it's rare for this size piece for the period. And you can imagine when you're putting the body together, all of these component parts that are on their own and coming together, you have to then fire and you can have things crack in the fire. You can have things break. So you may have to have multiple attempts. And so that's why these larger, more intricate pieces are rare because less of them were made successfully at the time. In the house library, Mrs. Roth ceramics that you see down there at the bottom, uh, those are the inspiration for the bright pops of teal throughout the library. And again, whenever I look through old photos, I love seeing all of these bright, vivid fabrics that would have been on all the chairs. You can just imagine them made out of these just fabulous materials and silks of the time. Um, we tend to forget how bright and vivid it could be when we only look at black and white. This is actually one of the oldest pieces in the collection. This 15th to 16th century Vietnamese vase is a lovely big oversized scale vase. 
Um, it's a born era piece. It was purchased for the library. We have it in the corner of the room. Um, it was turned into a lamp at some point in its life, but unlike uh, so many lamps that get drilled in the bottom and kind of, you know, take the risk of cracking the piece, this one is done with an insert. So this big bronze ormolu fitted uh, column sits into the middle of it and has a weight. And so that weight goes down into the center of the lamp and supports the shade and all of the hardware and everything so that this beauty wasn't drilled. It has been heavily restored um, due to damage at some point in its very long life, but would we all look so good at a few hundred years old? So it's always special that we're able to keep it in that corner of the library. In the reception room, we've definitely played with the famille rose pattern, which is French for pink family. Um, the style really harmonizes beautifully with our bright pink period sofas. And there's also shades of white, yellow, and green in the famille rose kind of decorative pattern. Um, and many of these are Chinese export, and some of them are copies of Chinese pieces um, trying to be sold in the European market for competition. Of course, these pieces you may have seen a million times in the house and never realized um, just how kind of special they are. These are late 19th century oversized lidded urns. Um, unfortunately, they're unidentified. We've never been able to find a mark on them. And it could be because the mark on the, the urns themselves has been hidden by the gilt bronze ormolu fittings that are wrapped around them and fit to them. It could be that that's disguising part of the mark. They are quite heavy. Um, they always take you know, two of us spotting somebody to lift them up on the ladder and wax them into place. Um, but they are a Roth era edition. We only see them pop up during the Roth era and they were always up on the mantelpiece there in the reception room during that period photos. The drawing room, uh, we've been able to restore an original 18th century pair of Chinese lidded ovoid vases once again to their place there. You can see on the western wall in this image, there's a pair of them. They're quite uh, miraculous. They're huge. They're beautiful giant urns, a few feet tall. Uh, they're from about 1736 to 1795, and they are hard paste porcelain made in China. We have not been able to identify the kiln, but these were born era pieces that were originally purchased for the house. Um, and we're not sure whether or not, you know, they could have come from the Webster Street house or one of the other homes. I've never been able to find them in a photo, but I do see them in the drawing room during that early period. Um, they were sold in the 1975 Bottoms and Bottoms auction that the Roths had, um, and they were returned to Filoli in 2006 um, when a local antique dealer uh, saw that they were here in a Gabrielle Mulan uh, picture book and was happy to bring them back and restore them. So it's always exciting when pieces like this come home to Filoli. In the dining room, we've literally set the table fit for royalty. Um, we're doing dessert service this year, and this lovely set um, is an 1844 to 1846 Sevres. This is the Chateau de Tuileri. Uh, it's a French set. It's a 59 piece dessert service. And the Tuileries Palace was a, a royal and imperial palace um, right in Paris, it stood right across the way um, on the banks of the River Seine. And it was right near the Louvre, right near the front there until 1871. Um, and you can kind of see the monogram with the uh, flying cupids on either side has that crowned Louis. It's for Louis Philippe. Uh, the French king that uh, was no longer king at the end of the French Revolution. Um, but this set bears not only uh, the Sevres Porcelain Factory, which is quite famous for their uh, hard paste porcelain in France, um, but also uh, the stamp of the chateau there. In the butler's pantry, as always, we have a rotating display uh, from our dishware collection, a number of original sets uh, to both the Bourne and Roth families, as well as other sets that are very similar to those that they had on site. And we like to rotate through, especially the bigger sets through this area, where you can see some of the decorative serving pieces, the big platters, things like that that are 
um, harder to see when they're out on display across the room, flat on a table. It's always kind of nice to be able to get up really close to these and see the beautiful hand-painted work. Many of the, the sets that are on display right now in the butler's pantry are hand-painted um, by those artists. Uh, and so they may be a common form or have a similar edge to another made by the same manufacturer, but it's the artist's painting that makes them truly special. The set that's on the center of the table under the vitrine is this just really gorgeous pearlware set. Um, and this is a dessert service. It's eight pieces have survived to us today from about 1820, made in Davenport, England. And this is a Roth era set that Mrs. Roth gave back to us as a part of her bequest after she passed. Her estate passed it back to us. And it's very possible that this could be a born era original. Many of the porcelain service and the silver services carried through with the sale of the house. Um, the uh, pantry was stocked as it were. And so many of those pieces they kept, um, some of them they sold, but this one, um, it, it has a very uh, Agnes feel to me. Um, not just uh, that Lurleen's kind of mid-century look, um, but this is a really collectible piece and we're really excited to be able to see it all the way in the round right now. As you exit and you go through the kitchens and you come back around, um, you'll end up back in the men's cloakroom before you exit. And here we're identifying and pulling out some of our Amari style um, is how you may commonly know it in the West. Um, technically it's Arita ware because it originated from the Arita region um, in Japan. And the color and popular um, was not only you know, a, a pattern that became popular um, in Japan and in China even. Um, the Chinese were trying to copy this Japanese style originally. Um, but Amari is the name of the port near Nagasaki, where these were first traded as early as the 17th century um, with the Dutch, Dutch East India Company. And so it became so popular and everybody on the export kind of uh, global market because they came from that uh, port, they started to become known as Amari ware, but uh, we're happy to start using Arita ware to give the region credit for its beautiful style. And you can see a piece here, it's hard paste porcelain. Um, this is a Chinese piece imitating that style from about 1785, but it's a really typical, perfect example of the color palette um, that Arita Ware has. And it's that navy blue, that bright red, kind of a gold or a tan, um, and then gold on a white body. And that's the color combination that you'll most often see. Well, I hope that this has inspired you to come and take a look at our exhibit, Bringing the Garden Indoors, Captured Blooms. It'll be running now through May 22nd, at which point our blue gold exhibit focused on water will take over both in the house and in the garden and on the estate. Um, an entire estate-wide exhibit focused on water, something that all of us in the region are thinking about on a daily basis. And we are open daily, especially during this season. Um, weekends are selling out. So please go online to philoli.org and reserve your ticket in advance. And I hope that you'll come out and take a stroll through the house um, and see these captured blooms and all these beautiful representations of flowers that we've brought indoors. And then go out to the garden and take a look at all of the lovely things that are in bloom out there. Thank you. Julie, thank you for that wonderful presentation about the collection of fine porcelain and all the different kinds of porcelain that you've educated us on this evening. So thank you. Now, next month, we will continue with another presentation done by a local artist, Swan Ho, who will be presenting her fantastic mosaic work that she does with tile. So I hope you will tune in next month to listen to another fabulous presentation. And once again, please take care of each other and stay well. Remember, one of the things that we admire about porcelain is its delicate fragility. We should learn, of course, to also appreciate the same in people.
Good night. Thank you for joining us.